Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. As always, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I are honored to be joined by none other than Rick Doblin. Many of you already know who Rick is. For those of you who don't, he's the founder and president of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. Rick's tireless efforts over almost 40 years in both clinical research and public policy reform have played a key role in bringing psychedelic medicine to the very exciting point that it is now. Reed and I talk with Rick about the origin story behind MAPS, the existential crisis humanity is facing, and the need for healing on a global scale, the potential FDA approval of MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD, the so-called fallen Mormon study on the safety of MDMA, the high bar that should be set for therapists who want to work with psychedelic tools and whether or not those therapists should have their own psychedelic experiences as part of that training, and much, much more. Speaking of training... Those of you who have been listening to the show for a while know that Numinous offers professional training pursuant to becoming a psychedelic-assisted practitioner. You can check out the courses we offer by clicking the link in the show notes or go to, going directly to numinous.com forward slash training. You can use the code PTF10 for 10% off selected trainings. You also hear Reed and I talk a lot about psychedelic clinical trials on the show we do those trials here at Numinous. If you or someone you know is interested in being a participant in a psychedelic clinical trial, you can click on the link in the show notes or go directly to numinous.com forward slash research to learn more about the trials we're currently running. This was a big interview today, so if you want to share this episode with somebody that you think might enjoy the interview, please do so. You can support the show in other ways by leaving a rating or review in places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Without further delay, I bring you Rick Doblin. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Uh, Reed and I are honored to be joined today by the intrepid Dr. Rick Doblin. <laughs> Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Reed. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And, you know, I, I have been intrepid. That's really a good word. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say I don't I don't use that uh, that term lightly. I think it applies. Um, I think most of our audience are going to be familiar with you, Rick. But uh, just in case there are a few who are not, maybe provide a brief intro and and maybe talk a bit about uh, founding the organization Maps. Okay, well, I'll I'll go back to uh, 1972 when I was um, doing uh, when I was 18 years old and reading a lot of uh, books starting about um, consciousness and psychedelics, taking LSD and mescaline, you know, somebody came by new college of Florida where I went with half a pound of mescaline. So I bought all of it and friends and I did a bunch of it. Um, and, and I got really confused. Um, you know, I had the delusion that the more drugs you take, the faster you evolve. And so I, I did. Uh, uh, I did my part, and um, and I found out that that was wrong. <laughs> that you really, I underemphasized the integration part. So out of confusion, I went to um, guidance counselor at college, and he was just the absolute right guidance counselor that I could have selected because he had a manuscript copy of Realms of the Human Unconscious: Observations from LSD Research from Stan Groff the book that wasn't even published until 1975 and he had it directly from Stan. So um, the reason I go back there is it was just reading Stan's book that totally um, persuaded me to devote my life to psychedelics. Um, you know, he talked about it was science. It had the reality check of therapy, but it was about um, consciousness that, the realms of the human unconscious that included um, sort of beyond ego, unit of mystical states that for me, what really did it was this idea of the political implications of the mystical experience that if we feel we're all connected and we're all part of something, then we'll be more accepting and appreciative of people that are different than us. So I also, also like the idea that, um, you know, Nixon was calling Leary the most dangerous man in America. And it, it made me think, hey, what is Leary doing right? 
And then I, I sort of woke up to the psychedelics as the backlash was happening. And so I thought, hey, you know, there, there's another, there's a reason for the backlash too. That sort of confirmed my theory of change. So um, that was now, you know, 52 years ago, but that's where I decided to focus my life on psychedelics. But because I had the complete wrong idea about, you know, just more drugs in, more consciousness out, <laughs> I ended up spending 10 years um, getting grounded, building things, and went back to college as a freshman in uh, 1982 back to a workshop at Stan um, and Christina Groff at Esalen. That's where I learned about MDMA. And so I learned about MDMA before the backlash. And so that's where um, I thought that I had this opportunity to try to gather support from all these people that were more experienced than I were, was at um, psychedelic therapy, psychedelic research. Um, but I had a lot of time as a student focusing on trying to become a psychedelic therapist. So I actually started a nonprofit before MAPS in 1984, um, which was with uh, Debbie Harlow and Elise Agar. And this was to, to gather support for what we knew would be an eventual crackdown by the DEA. Because when I learned about MDMA, it was both, a, um, it was legal and it was used as a therapy drug under the name Adam, but it sort of escaped also into party context under the name ecstasy. So we started this um, nonprofit in order to generate um, support and provide tax deductible opportunities for people to help us, which we knew would be kind of an expensive legal case. So summer of 84, DEA moves to criminalize MDMA. And um, I went to DC to try to um, during the 30 day public comment period, I went on day 30, took them by surprise and, and we got this hearing and we won the hearing and the DEA administrative law judge said MDMA should be in schedule three, meaning it should be available as a medicine, but it would be illegal for recreational use. And um, unfortunately, the administrative law judges only make recommendations so that the administrator of the DEA rejected the recommendation, put it in schedule one for completely bogus reasons. And so when that happens, you can sue them in the appeals courts where the um, judges do have the power to compel. So we, we won the first case in the appeals court and they remanded it back to the DEA. The DEA came up with a second bogus explanation that basically was the same as FDA approval. We appealed again, we won a second time. And finally on the third try, the DEA lawyers figured out how to basically give away their power to reschedule to the FDA the appeals court accepted it. So in 86, well, the handwriting was on the wall. So in 86 is when I started MAPS. And this was the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And it was conceived of as a nonprofit psychedelic pharmaceutical company, because at the time government grants weren't happening, pharmaceutical companies weren't interested. Um, there was really, um, so much opposition that investors wouldn't put any money in. So it had to be all done through donations. Um, and that was now 38 years ago. <laughs> and now we are finally um, thinking that in this year, 2024, that we may end up with MDMA in Schedule 3. Um, basically, we um, raised about $150 million in donations over the time. Um, it wasn't enough to build a commercialization company. So we have taken um, about $100 million in investor money in a for-profit but public benefit pharmaceutical company called Lycos, um, which MAPS is the single largest owner of the shares, although we are a minority owner. Um, and we appoint six to the eight members of the board of directors. We have 10 to one voting shares. So MAPS, the nonprofit, does have some influence on how this for-profit company is going to go. Um, but it's going to be a, a balance between uh, public benefit and return to shareholders. And uh, I'll just say in 86, um, when I started MAPS, I thought what I was going to do is, as Steve, become a clinical psychologist <laughs> with a PhD in order to do psychotherapy outcome research. And that's basically where I had been planning since uh, 72. I graduated in 87. Nobody would let me in um, because I wanted to do research with MDMA that had just been criminalized. And so out of 
uh, frustration. I was like, where am I going to bring my life now? And I, I use marijuana for creative thinking. And so I thought, okay, I'm blocked right now. I'm going to smoke some pot and think about it. And so during this uh, thinking process, I realized, um, you know, I wanted too much too soon. I wanted to do the science, but the politics is in the way. And so I realized I should just study the politics. So that's where I veered off and got uh, into the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard uh, with uh, started in 88, got my master's and PhD in public policy with focus on regulation of the medical use of psychedelics. I also thought, you know, since I was going to try to um, see how legit I could look, I, I identified myself from the age of 18 as a counterculture drug using criminal. And the arc of my life has been to, to be counter, from counterculture to culture, from criminal to legal and, and sustain the drug using part, which I've continually found to be enlightening and useful in all different ways. Um, and what I ended up um, realizing is that um, this study of public policy was like psychotherapy for the culture that I was studying before a psychotherapy for individuals. And now I'm sort of studying um, psychotherapy for sick public policies and how to change the mind of a culture. So um, so those are my two sort of strands of training with Stan Groff and the holotropic breath work as learning how to um, work with individuals. And then the public policy work is how, how to change the mind of cultures. Um, and so that's just uh, a good introduction. <laughs> that is a good introduction, Rick. I think, you know, people <laughs> often uh, describe you as kind of the torchbearer and carrying mm -hmm. the torch through the, these dark periods where psychedelics were, uh, research and use of psychedelics were pushed out and I guess the therapeutic use pushed into the underground. And um, I'm just curious to know how you're feeling now at this point where, you know, we're looking like a decision will be made in August perhaps about MDMA? Um, well, not perhaps. I mean, the FDA is obligated to tell us whether they will approve MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD for prescription use by August 11th. Hmm. So it, it has to be a decision one way or another um, on, well, very quickly, I'll say. So from 86, when I started MAPS to 1992, we had um, around five different protocols, all rejected by the FDA for different kind of things from MDMA, so um, Harvard, uh, UC San Francisco, University of um, uh, Mexico, Albuquerque, others, Wayne State, all these were rejected. 92 is when the FDA turned around and said that they would um, open the door to psychedelic research. Um, I, I had... Um, tried to get a job at the FDA after I got my master's and mm -hmm. um, I came really close to getting it. Went through this whole long um, process where it ended up, I had to have a conversation with the head of all drug research for all drugs at FDA. Um, they decided to hire me and that was great. I was thought, okay, I can learn how to um, work the system from the inside out. Uh, and at the very last minute, the DEA, uh, said that they would refuse to work with me. They told the FDA that they would refuse to work with me because this was the branch of the FDA that mm. dealt with controlled substances, psychedelics, and I'd sued the DEA before and yeah. won, and they weren't particularly happy about that. So um, so I watched this group. They said they would help me informally. So I'd watched them in this 1992 meeting where they decided, based on a protocol that Charlie Grove and I had submitted to the FDA, for MDMA for cancer patients with anxiety. This was a big time for the MDMA neurotoxicity. It didn't make sense to any of us. You know, we were fine, it seemed like, but we felt if we work with people that are gonna die soon, um, you know, th that would get around the neurotoxicity issues. But then the FDA said they would open the door to psychedelic research. And that's really, when we think about the psychedelic renaissance, that was the key moment that was now, you know, 32 years ago. But they also said that we had to start from the very beginning. Um, none of what was learned outside of FDA really mattered. So we had to start with a phase one dose response safety study that took us through the 90s. Um, we started with MDMA for PTSD. Um, once I felt that we could address the neurotoxicity concerns, um, we went from 2000 to 2016 doing phase two studies with MDMA. And so 30 years after MAPS had started, 
November 29th, 2016, we had the uh, FDA um, end of phase two meeting. They said we could go mm -hmm. to phase three, uh, but I knew we shouldn't do that. I knew that we needed to enter what's called the special protocol assessment process because um, there's a fundamental challenge of how to do a double blind study with drugs that when you take them, chances are you know you've taken them. <laughs> For, uh, yeah, I'm just laughing now because I, I, I did eat uh -huh. um, some chocolates that I, I, this is not recently, but not, not that long ago, I ate some chocolates that I thought were just chocolates and they turned out to be mushroom chocolates. So I, I was able to tell, you know, I, I completely thought it was uh, a chocolate. So uh, anyway, once the mushrooms started kicking in, I was like, oh, fuck, I am tripping. Yeah, an, an accidental <laughs> self-double-blind so, study that you just read. <laughs> yeah, so so that just is one one bit of information. So it's, so I, I, I realized that we had to enter into this special protocol assessment process that took us eight months, and we ended up coming to agreement with FDA on the phase three design. And we got what's called an agreement letter, which means that FDA is legally bound to approve the drug if the design that you negotiate and the statistical analysis plan and all the other safety data that they want to see, if you get statistically significant evidence of efficacy, if you've got no new safety problems, and if you survive FDA audit. And so that was a, that, that's why when, when, when I talk about August 11th um, of 2024, um, I'm pretty hopeful that the FDA will say yes. So we started our first phase three study in 2018. We published it in 2021. Um, at the end of the year, science said that uh, it was one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the year. We were particularly gratified because 20 years before that, science had published this most bogus paper on um, MDMA huh. causing dopaminergic neurotoxicity, potentially causing Parkinson's, funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, done at Johns Hopkins. And, the, the whole thing didn't make sense. They never should have published it. The, um, there were a lot of internal contradictions. The editor of Science, though, put out a press release saying taking MDMA was like playing Russian roulette with your brain. Th this is where the, the concerns about serotonin had really been diminishing. And so out of desperation, they started saying, oh, now it hurts dopamine. Um, after a year of us challenging what they were doing, they came out uh, the researchers and said, oops, uh, we mistakenly gave methamphetamine to these primates instead of MDMA. Um, and science had to retract all the papers and everything. So 20 years later for them to say, oh, MDMA is one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the world was really satisfying. Um, and mm -hmm. then last year um, we published uh, the second phase three study. We meaning Lycos now the pharma company, not the nonprofit. And on uh, December 11th, the, all of the data that we had been gathering for, um, you know, quite a few years, uh, more than 30 years, uh, you know, roughly 36 years, um, or at this point, at that point it was 37 years. So we, we submitted all that to the FDA and the FDA has two months to review the file to see if all of the data is there that they're gonna to need to evaluate um, safety and efficacy. And on um, February 9th, they accepted the file. So we, we do think that if there would have been kind of an opportunity for political interference to take place, it would have come in this decision not to accept the file. Once they decided to accept the file and said that the research is sufficient that, and the data that we, that Lycos had submitted was there. Um, then they gave priority review, which means because it's a breakthrough therapy, it's a six month review. And, and so um, August 11th is when we have to hear where, or when Lycos will have to hear that the next big moment that will be um, a milestone will be sometime in June or so, we're not exactly sure with an FDA advisory committee meeting. And so we, we believe that's gonna happen. Um, and so it'll be roughly um, 38 and a half years uh, <laughs> since the uh, started MAPS. But wow. for, for those people that are parents, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're raising your kids, they, they seem like they'll be there forever. And then, you know, they go off to college and stuff. And then you look back and like, hey, where did the 20 years go? Um, so I, I'm saying that just to say that a 38-year plan or something like that, 
it's not actually that long. And so it's been worth it all the whole time. And so now we anticipate that MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD will likely be the first psychedelic assisted therapy approved by the FDA. And then it will be followed a couple of years later by psilocybin and then other drugs will come along as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I love I love uh, getting more of the backstory because I've I've got to admit I've always drawn a lot of inspiration from from you, Rick, and uh, the Maps Crusade, and you as an intrepid explorer. And I've been so curious about those things. Like, what did you think the path looked like uh, back then in '86 <laughs> when you started Maps? Did you say it was a drug a drug development uh, pursuit at that time even? Just curious, yeah. like if you had a guess, then what uh, what you think the the pathway might look like? Well, um, first off, um, one question is how is it that Maps with MDMA is now years ahead, multiple years ahead of psilocybin in in terms of making it to medicine? And the reason is because we began from the very beginning to think about it as FDA drug development where the researchers with psilocybin from Hefter, from uh, Council on Spiritual Practices, the researchers at Hopkins, NYU, and elsewhere, they came more from an academic background. And so they weren't thinking as much about how do they go through the regulatory system as quickly as they can. They were thinking more about knowledge and what do we learn and, oh, statistical significance is important which it is, it's critical later in phase three, but it's not so critical in phase one and phase two. So the when I started MAPS, um, I thought it might never work. You know, I just thought that this is something that I had to try. And what, one of my favorite uh, conspiracy theories um, is about me. And uh, it's that uh, I was a secret CIA agent and that my mission was to delay the approval of MDMA because it, it could lead to, um, you know, peace breaking out or something like that. And, and the evidence for this conspiracy theory, to get back to your question, Reed, the evidence is that I have been 100 percent wrong on all of my projections on how long it will take and how much it will cost. So the theory <laughs> is that I'm always saying it's right around the corner but actually it's being delayed and delayed and delayed. So I'm keeping keep people thinking it's actually moving forward, but I'm just tricking them into uh, thinking. So um, when I started um, <laughs> in 86, um, I, it was the only way forward. There, there was no other way that I could see of that could even conceivably work. So it didn't matter how long it took or how much it cost. It was just the only opening door. Um, and, and, and I thought, um, you know, it might never work. And, and you, you talk about people that were um, anti-slavery act activists or women's voting, you know, and, and change takes generations a lot of times. So, you know, and, and this was in the dark days of Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan and just the whole real escalation of the drug war. But I just knew that the, the experience of MDMA and the value of MDMA and other psychedelics were so different than the propaganda that I just felt eventually, um, you know, the, people would understand and appreciate the, the the incredible values that were that were here when when used appropriately. But I, I had about a um, five year plan for for about fifteen years. I, I had a ten year plan for about twenty years. <laughs> um, now I really do think it'll be uh, in August. We we will hear. Um, I also had no idea what it would really cost. Um, uh, one of the things I did do for my dissertation, this is a, kind of an important point, is that when you hear the pharmaceutical companies, they'll tell you it costs billions of dollars to make a drug into a medicine. So, you know, how is it that a tiny nonprofit could actually do this or, or even any of these for-profit psychedelic companies that are standing up? Well, I, I, I did a, look into that number. And it's it comes from the Tuff Center for the Study of Drug Development. And they have an arrangement with all the pharma companies that they contribute their data to them, to the Tuff Center for the Study of Drug Development. 
And the tough center will, will analyze the data, put out the results, but take out, you know, which companies gave them the data. So they keep it all private. So it turns out that when you look at the estimates that pharma companies give you, one of the factors that they put in there was um, opportunity cost on the money, meaning these are businesses. So the opportunity cost is what they could have earned if they would have invested the money. At the time I looked into this, they were assuming 12% return per year, which compounds pretty quickly. Um, but about half the money is just, it's not real money out the door, it's opportunity cost on the money. Then the other big thing is that they amortize all the failures into the few successes. So pharma companies will often, you know, study thousands of drugs, synthesize thousands of drugs, and then, you know, hundreds go into preclinical studies and then phase one safety studies, and then, you know, diminishing numbers go down. But they, they often only get a few drugs approved every year, each company. And so all the costs of the failures are lumped into the ones that succeed. Now that's not actual cash on, on the pathway. And if you start with something that you already know is gonna succeed, like psychedelics, we, we, mm -hmm. you know, or we believe they would succeed. Then the other big part is all that money comes from um, a lot of the safety studies. You have a new molecule and you've got to really characterize the safety pretty well, but the advantage of MDMA and psilocybin and other things, um, I call it the Aikido uh, strategy for drug development where you use the momentum or the energy of your opponent against them. So at this point, governments have spent four to five hundred million dollars all over the world into uh, what's wrong with MDMA to try to justify the criminal penalties. And so we've been able to capture all of that published data. There's over five thousand papers in, in the, the scientific literature on MDMA or ecstasy. So we didn't have to spend, you know, we saved hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on safety studies because MDMA has also been taken by tens of millions of people. And so we really know the rare things that happen also. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times drugs get approved after they've only been studied in a few thousand people or less. And then once they're marketed, you see, oh, one in 50,000 have this terrible thing happen or one in 100,000 have this. But we know all that from, from MDMA. Um, and so, I guess when I started, I, I had the my, my first mistake, <laughs> which was um, all the people who were doing ecstasy. I just thought, wow, look at all these people. Ecstasy is getting really, really popular. If I can just get $10 from everybody that's using ecstasy, then we'll have all the money we need to make MDMA new medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't realize, first off, that those people would think we'd never succeed anyway. And secondly, if they had 10 bucks, they'd rather just buy more ecstasy. <laughs> so, uh -huh. That, that kind of shifted to the major donor strategy. Um, and, but once we um, you know, got approval for the first study in 92, th then I was really hopeful. And what happened in the middle of the 2000s, once we started the first project with MDMA for PTSD, and, and this I think was a real turning point in my sense that we were being given a fair shake by the FDA is that we went to uh, Dr. Tom Laughrin, was the head of psychiatry products, and we said that we really want to um, get the best results for the patients. And part of the key factor is not the drug, it's the therapy, and it's the training of the therapists. And so we need some legal way to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. And we went back and forth with the FDA and they, they basically said, we can't give you approval to just give it to people. But it, if you wrap it in a scientific study, you can, and we can uh, justify it, then you could limit who can volunteer for the study to be people in your training program, therapists in your training program. So the, the FDA gave us that permission and we've had about 125 people go through that. And that that's really where I felt we had a fair shake from the FDA that they were letting us properly train the therapists. Um, th there, there was, um, a time where, um, well, let's see, 15 years ago, about, um, one of our board of directors, um, died and left maps, uh, five, five and a half million dollars, uh, uh, Shauna Haley in his will. 
And I thought, okay, this is about half what we're going to need for phase three. So let's just save this <laughs> and um, until we get to phase three. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I've been 100% wrong in the money estimates and the time estimates. But the, the reason why it didn't really matter, and this gets back to um, why I was so motivated, um, I had a dream in my early 20s of a Holocaust survivor saying that um, he was miraculously saved from death and he was saved for a purpose, but he didn't know what the purpose was. And so this is in my dream. And in, in the dream, he's telling me, now I know what my purpose is. It's to tell you to study psychedelics and bring back this way where people can experience our interconnectedness. And that would be the antidote to genocide and racism and all of that. So no matter how hard it was with FDA or DEA, um, I always felt like the shadow of the Holocaust behind me and that my life was way better and freer and that I needed to use my privilege to, to keep at it. So that, that's why I never gave up. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing. And the how do you make sense of that Holocaust dream? Like, where did that get planted in there? I'm just so curious, or, um, or has it come to fruition in any of the kind of international work you've been doing with MDMA as well? Well, um, it came, well, I'll say, how did it get planted? And then I'll say how it entered some of my psychedelic trips. Um, you know, I, I was raised, I was born in 53, not too long after the World War II had ended. I, I had distant relatives killed in the Holocaust, um, loads of Israeli relatives. Um, and, and so I just was um, raised on stories of the Holocaust. And, and basically I was told this story that um, I come from refugees, you know, fleeing anti-Semitism. Around 1880, my um, great grandparents came from Russia to the United States. My grandfather on my Dad's side came in 1920 from Poland and then the American dream. And they were able to do well and find a new life. And then they were able to give me um, a certain freedom and privilege to um, kind of address deeper threats. You can, it's like, you just think about all the rich people going down on the Titanic. You know, you can have all the money in the world, but if, if your universe is going down, you're going down with it. Um, and, and so, the sense was that um, I was this multi generate in this multi generational stream. I happened to be I, I got the lucky card, <laughs> you, know, you could say that that I was the one that born into America, born into freedom, totally supported by by my parents, but um, traumatized just by stories of the world. Second generation, second distance, you know, you could say uh, traumatized. Uh, young boy, Cuban Missile Crisis. Now we can blow up the whole world, and and I took that seriously, and uh, as as I should have, um, and, and so I just, you know, as as I was growing up, I really felt that it was psychological factors that really mattered. That our brilliance, technology, that we could solve all the problems. We could have food for everybody. We could have shelter for everybody. It's just we have such unequal distribution of resources, and we are so much trying to grab stuff from others. Um, but I felt that through the brilliance of our mind, we could really build paradise on earth, but we have to evolve our emotions and our spiritual capacity to equal our brilliance of our minds. Um, and so that, that sort of focused me on, on psychedelics. Um, but then how it entered my um, psychedelic trips, there was this one trip that I had, this is now um, 19... Um, near the end of 84, early 85, this was at Esalen and a group of us with uh, uh, Terrence McKenna and Annie Weil and, and Ralph Metzner and others were smoking DMT for the first time. So this is my first time. So um, under the influence of DMT, I had this incredible um, experience of being blasted out of myself and being part of this, you know, big universe picture um, and, and it was glorious. And I, I just was starting to think about the sweep of history and the, the slow pace of billions of years of evolution and, and all of that. And it was just this, you know, glorious, wonderful thing. And then I had this thought in my mind, which um, I'm grateful for, but at the time it was shattering. It was like, well, 
if you're part of everything and everything's part of you, then Hitler is part of you too. It's not out there. It's in here. And I was like, oh, fuck, that seems right. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was just really, really um, difficult for me. I'd always like, you know, it's like, well, one of the things that Jung has said, which uh, I'm very inspired by, is he said the most important political, social, and um, therapeutic thing we can do is to withdraw the projection of our shadow onto others. You know, now if we could teach Trump that, that would be a real good thing. But um, but you have to be willing to learn these lessons. Um, so so that was shattering. And then the very next day, we were experimenting with ketamine. So underneath ketamine, I somehow had this um, hovering up and behind Hitler as he was giving a speech to, you know, the masses. And and I, I thought, okay, how do I get inside his head to sort of psychoanalyze him or just so that he can, um, so I can understand, so he doesn't have to be so uh, uh, murderous. You know, how do I get inside his head? What, what, what can I do? And, and I saw this whole dynamic between Hitler and the crowd and, you know, all the people giving him energy and then he pushing it back to them and back and forth. And, and then I came to this realization that um, there's no way I can get into his head. That, that he just um, is getting too much out of it and he's not willing, but that the solution for peace would be all the people that are giving away their power and getting less from it. So what that meant to me is this two parallel strategy leading towards mass mental health and a spiritualized humanity, one being drug development through FDA, the other being drug policy reform so that People can have legal access to all these substances without having to go through science or religion and not necessarily needing a diagnosis. So, so the Hitler theme and the, the Holocaust theme has been really running through my entire life. Um, and, and still to this day, and it's something that um, I've, I've come to really be more terrified, I would say, by watching what's been happening to America the last couple of years and how the big lie, which is so obviously false. Um, and in fact, that that's a feature, not a bug of the big lie. You know, I, I was always thinking, how can people logically believe this stuff that Hitler was saying or that Trump is saying? And, and, and I realized the more difficult it is to believe, the more you are um, asserting tribal loyalty by saying you believe it. So I think this whole concept of the big lie, um, you know, it, it's, it's a way in which um, people surrender their rationality, make alliances based on tribes. Um, uh, 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 and th there was actually a um, analysis um, by some psychologists that worked with the CIA um, and they were looking abroad at, at how do you predict uh, civil war? Or how, how do you predict when cultures are going to fall apart? Um, and then uh, the, the scientists looked at the, the U.S. as well. And what they found is that for a civil war, really, and, um, you know, there's gradations of it. But the first thing is that you need a group of people that are in power that are losing power. And so this is the white male Christian nationalist community. You know, America is becoming multicultural and we're... So, so there is this sense of cult, of dominance slipping away. And when you have that coupled with um, people identifying politically, not on the basis of policies, but on the basis of tribes, that's where you get this incredible polarization. So that, that is where America is. But one of the key strategies that I learned at the Kennedy School and, and, and had thought of actually before when we started with this MDMA for PTSD was that we really needed to try to build bipartisan support to bring psychedelics up from the underground. And we have managed to do that. There, there's very few things that are not part of the culture wars right now. And psychedelics are one of those. That's We've got broad bipartisan support from some of the most... Um, you know, well-known uh, Trumpists. We, we had a bill in Congress 
just to illustrate this, a couple of years ago, that was trying to get federal money for psychedelic research. It was co-sponsored by Matt Gates and AOC. You could not find two people from the furthest wow. extremes working together on this. Um, so it, it's been um, more frightening to see, you know, the big lie taking such a big um uh, part of the discourse, the political discourse here in America right now. And, and I understand how um, in Germany, the most civilized country in Europe, supposedly, that out of that comes Hitler. And um, so I, I think the, uh, the other part of this, what we need is in addition to helping us feel that we're all connected, and there's many different ways to do that. The astronauts talk about that, looking back at Earth on space. The other is we need to help people work through their traumas so that they don't see the world through this fear-based lens. That's where MDMA therapy and other therapies come in. So it's not just about spiritual connection. It's also about therapy so people can deal with their own inner issues and then be able to... Um, see each situation for what it is rather than bringing the traumas of the past to overlay what, whatever they are. So uh, I've had enough motivations um, to, to keep me focused. Uh, the, the way I've thought about myself is this sort of, if you think about the planet, you know, I'm this like um, cauldron of fear and anxiety wrapped in privilege, mm. you know, so the outer layers are this privilege that has permitted me not to be overwhelmed by the fear, but to be using it as a driving motivation force. Yeah, Rick, I'm, I'm struck by sort of the work that the opportunities that are, that are sort of before us and that the work that needs to be done on both the macro and the micro scale and, and this tipping point that you're describing, it reminds me of, um, Reed and I had a conversation with Chris Bache, uh, ah, author of, great. LSD in the mind of the universe. And he talked about feeling like we're sort of, um, going through labor, you know, as mm. a, as a global society and that we're in, we're in the canal and we're experiencing a, a you know, sort of a constriction and that, uh, the decisions we make over the next few years are going to have huge implications for the future of our species. And that resonates with me as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about, um, Global warming, the upside of that is that we realize we're all connected. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this idea that um, we're impacting things on a planetary scale and that we need, you know, global cooperation, the Internet, the way some or other in the air right now, but, you know, between me and the computer in the air is all the information on the Internet. And you, you could, you know, tune in and you can get to it. Uh, astonishing. So... We have, uh, you know, this, um, yeah, miraculous technology. Um, but, but I do think that there's never been a time when people have been so bumping up against each other, uh -huh. meaning, you know, you can have different religions that could be in relative isolation, but now through the internet and just through jet planes and travel and all of that, we know how interconnected we are. And, and so it, it's, um, it, it, and the weaponry that we've have now is more powerful than it's ever been. I, you know, Oppenheimer won the Academy Award, yeah. um, and, and you know, every once in a while, Putin threatens Russia to will use uh, nuclear weapons to not lose in Ukraine, stuff like that. So that I think there is this new consciousness shift that is, um, on the one hand, more and more people see it how we're interconnected and and we need to think globally. And on the other hand, um, there's a rise of fundamentalism mm -hmm. of all different kinds. So I, I think there is that uh, dynamic. So Stan Groff would talk about it as the basic perinatal matrix three. This is where you're going through the birth canal, but your 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 paradise of being in the womb is is threatened now, and there's uh, pressures. You don't know the way out yet, and what's going to happen, and it's very dynamic and very aggressive, and and so. You know, that's kind of the place that we're at as humans. And it's going to be a challenge. You know, can we really survive? I mean, people talk all the time about um, how vast the universe is. And so how is it that um, 
we don't know if there's life on other planets. Uh, right. I mean, it, it just makes, from a statistical point of view, it, it's almost impossible that life could only be on on the U.S. on the on the Earth. But we we don't know, and so w- one of the questions is maybe when cultures developed uh, or species developed to the way that they've got our intellectual capacity, maybe it's not that uncommon that they develop intellectually more than emotionally and spiritually, and maybe all these other worlds have destroyed each other. Um, we, we don't know, but it, but it's a real clear case that um, we we might destroy ourselves, and so I think that's where. You know, in my TED talk, I talked about the um, the race between consciousness and catastrophe. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that um, it, it's good to be hopeful and to proceed as if what we do will make a difference. Um, but it may not in the big picture. Um, but we, we just have to do our best. So I, I think where Chris was talking about this um, sort of evolutionary stage, there's actually a, a real linkage, I would say, to Abraham Maslow. So a lot of people know about the hierarchy of needs from Maslow and you know your basic survival needs and then belonging needs, the self-esteem needs. And the highest of this that's taught in school still today is this idea of self-actualization, that, that you become your full self and that, you, that, that that's kind of this ideal to, to maximize your potential and express yourself. But... What is not taught in schools, hardly at all, which is really surprising, is that in the last few years of his life, Maslow changed the hierarchy of needs, in part because he met uh, Stan Groff and others, and he started looking at uh, psychedelic research. But where he changed it was from self-actualization, which you could say is kind of like a libertarian dream, you know, let me become my best self, it's self-transcendence. Right. And so there is this kind of way where you realize that you're not an isolated individual. You're part of this group. You're part of everything. And we need to sort of think beyond our, our what's sort of selfishly best for ourselves. So I think it's that consciousness shift that um, humanity is struggling with now. And that, that's why I think it's so critical that we do bring forth the psychedelic technologies and try to do them in a way where there's not a backlash. So, you know, that, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out um, if there would be a backlash, um, where would it come from? And, mm-hmm. and how do we proactively try to um, minimize the chances that that would happen? And when you look around where the backlash would come from, I'm sort of curious what you guys would think. But for me, it, it's likely to come, well, if it comes at all, it will come from fundamentalists who are actually threatened by this new emergence where um, at, the, at the same time, that they, the fundamentalists have the most to gain also because they are seeing things in very literal ways in you know miracle stories that are hard to believe. Um, and there's a deeper way once you start thing, seeing things metaphorically, poetically, emotionally, that are things that we can relate to and we can achieve ourselves. So I, I think the fundamentalist worldview, you, you're, you're just, a, I just am reminded by one of the most courageous things I've ever read about. Um, th- this is like a little bit like the worldview of Copernicus and Galileo. You know, when, when people thought the center of the universe was the earth and um, Father Bruno, who, um, was a supporter both of plant medicines, but also of uh, the view that the earth was not the center of the universe. He got burned at the stake by the Inquisition. And what he said was um, to the inquisitors after he said, um, after he heard his sentence, your fear in sentencing me is greater than my fear in being sentenced. Wow. To burn at the stake. So, People are so attached to their worldview, to their sense of self. Um, Stan has talked about it, and a lot of people have talked about it, that this ego dissolution that you can get with classic psychedelics, a lot of people confuse that with physical death, that when you lose your sense of self, then you're actually physically dying. Um, Stan told this really great story one time about how in um, 
the 50s when he was learning about LSD and becoming a psychiatrist that um, he sat for people before he had his own LSD experience. And he would see them coming up against this kind of fear that they were actually dying, this sort of ego dissolution, and they thought that they were actually dying. And he would keep reassuring them, you're not really physically dying, you're okay, this is a psychological mechanism. Um, all right, so then it comes along his time to take LSD for his first time. And he started um, feeling that he might be dying himself also. And, and he told himself this story that um, when he was young, he had this uh, allergy uh, and he had this illness and somehow or other that had changed his chemistry so that nobody else was dying, but he actually was dying because his blood, his chemistry was different. And it took him a while to work through that, to realize that he was also just in, enwrapped in this fear of losing his sense of identity or being replaced by something bigger. So I, I think that... Um, I think that there's a real good chance, though, that we will not have a backlash of any major proportion when psychedelics become medicines. And, and already we have incredible number of psychedelic churches, um, right. which are not being enforced by the police. And, and I think part of that is because you have 100,000 plus people die every year from opiate overdoses. And, you know, if they go after psychedelic churches, without a lot of victims, people are like, Hey, why don't you pay attention to what's really the problem? Um, so I think we're, we're, um, we're at a good time. And, and I think there is this consciousness shift. And I think the next, uh, 10, 20, 30 years are really going to determine the fate of humanity going forward. And hopefully yeah. we'll be able to make contributions, both in helping people work through their traumas and their depressions and also, giving them these touchstones to being part of something uh, larger than themselves. So Rick, on, on the topic of helping people through their, their traumas and such, um, one of the things that I really wanted to get your take on was the training of psychedelic therapists, of therapists who are going to use these psychedelic tools. Uh, because certainly psychedelics are being used in all kinds of contexts by all kinds of guides, facilitators and indigenous contexts. And, you know, we're talking today about moving into the Western medical context. And so I remember talking to Bruce and Marcella when I was trained, Bruce, Bruce Poulter and Marcella Odolora, when I would, went through my MAPS training. And I remember feeling a bit overwhelmed during the training, like, wow, the bar seems really high for people, therapists who are going to be working with these psychedelic tools. And I asked Marcella, I said, you know, Marcella, I feel like the bar is high. What do you think? And she said, yeah, it is high and, and it should be high. And so I'm curious, kind of what your perspective is. What what do you think are the essential qualities and competencies that a therapist should have if they're going to work with these tools? Well, um, let me also just relate this to the broader two uh, track strategy that I talk about, both you know drug development to make these into medicines, and then also drug policy reform. Mm-hmm. And so they may seem contradictory, but but under the drug development, there should be training of therapists, and, and I'll get into what that training should be and what the qualifications should be. And ideally, then this becomes covered by insurance. And they're only, you know, unlike S ketamine, which has been approved by um, the FDA Spravato as a take home medicine, not it, it can be a take home medicine uh, through telemedicine, or it's administered to people but without therapy. And I think that that's, um, on, you know, other than that, though, with, with MDMA and psilocybin, they'll be under direct supervision of either therapist or psychological support, whatever you want to, want to say. But at the same time, for legalization, I think it should be available for people um, to purchase and use on their own, you know, without, without highly trained therapists, you know, and it's up to them to decide you know, if they have a diagnosis of PTSD or whatever, they still should be able to, people should be able to get it on their own and do this. And there will be more problems that way. But I think the problems of the drug prohibition are way worse. And we want to train people in psychedelic peer support, help each other and what, what it really means. Um, but under FDA drug development, when we're talking about public money, in a sense, insurance being paying for it, it should be a very high bar. So I just want to make that clear. It, I, it should be available to people without any kind of 
with, with a simple kind of a test or something of different ways and then a license so that if you misbehave, you lose your license or you have to go back to education. All right. But from a therapy point of view, where we're bringing stuff up for the underground, um, I think that there's um, three parts of the Lycos training program. Uh, the, the first part is that, at least now according to the FDA, we have a two-person therapy team. The first person has to have a license to do therapy, and this can be a license of any kind, meaning uh, clinical social workers or marriage and family counselor, wh whatever, somebody that's just got a license to do therapy. And then the second person doesn't need a license. They could be like an apprentice. Right, right now, they need um, a thousand hours behavioral health experience and a bachelor's degree. I think the bachelor's degree is unnecessary for the second person. I, I'd like to keep the two-person team, but I think the trying to reduce the costs to have the second person be more an apprentice. All right, so um, the most important thing I would say for um, therapists is their own personal psychedelic experiences so that they know what they're really talking about. It's, it's very frightening. Uh, as I just described, even Stan Groff thought he was dying. You know, this ego dissolution is seeing him. He, he thought he was dying and, and, you need to be able to sit through that and not panic and understand deeper what's going on. And we all have things that are difficult for us that we've suppressed. So it's scary to bring them to the surface. So therapists with their own experience um, will really better understand the courage that it takes for them to do things. And the fact that if you open up instead of suppress, then you can actually come to a better equilibrium afterwards. And that expressing really profound feelings of sadness or anxiety or depression or stuckness, you know, that, that just accepting them and feeling them is, is important. Um, so I, I think that we're building on top of the standard therapy training. So that's why we say the first person needs to have um, a license to do therapy. Um, as we go around the world, actually, we're going to work with a lot of countries where there's massive amounts of trauma, but hardly any therapists or psychiatrists. So we're going to have to find sort of local healers and different kind of group contexts. But I think the six day training program, part one, you could say that we have is a retreat. Um, people live together, work together, you know, usually at different resorts or hotels. Uh, a lot of it is watching videotapes of therapy sessions. It's also um, role play and all sorts of lectures about different things. And that's about as minimal you know, but it's enough of an introduction for people to see there's a different approach um, of supporting what's emerging, you know, supporting the inner healing intelligence and not imposing structure. It's not guided imagery. Um, the second part is this optional self-experience. So while I talked about how important that is, um, it, it's very important to say that that will never be required that it should always be optional, that we should never require people to do a drug, that they should always have that option. And ideally that's the challenge. How do we create that option in a legal way that's relatively inexpensive, not part of a big research study? Um, and then the third part of the training is this idea of supervision. As people work with their first PTSD patient, um, well, um, Lycos will be requiring, I believe, uh, that the sessions be videotaped and that then they be reviewed by adherence raters and by supervisors that then give feedback back to the, the person, uh, the therapist, about how they're acting in alignment with the inner directed therapy that we used in phase three. However, once they've demonstrated that and then we say, okay, you've been supervised, now you're able to go off on your own, then people don't need to follow that method. They can innovate, they could do, they could blend it with whatever they want to. Um, so I, I think the training of the therapist is something that um, is the most important part of what we're trying to do as a medicine where there will be insurance coverage. You know, our, our phase three design is actually um, three MDMA sessions, one month apart. 12 90 minute non drug psychotherapy sessions. So it's 42 hours of therapy, which is substantial. You know, so you could basically say if somebody's in psychotherapy for uh, 
an hour a week, you know, you know, that's about a year, not counting vacations and things like that. So that, that's about a year of therapy. So can we sort of compare where somebody is at after on average, after a year of therapy and where are they at after three months of this intensive, you know, three MVMA sessions, each eight hour long. And, and, at least for a large population of people that we enroll in our studies with moderate to severe PTSD, you know, the first study had people that had PTSD for 14 years on average, one third over 20 years. And a lot of these people had had therapy, you know, throughout or medication or, so I think that the, um, the key factor that has been demonstrated in psychotherapy outcome research that is the most important factor to whether people get better or not is not the school of therapy. It's not that, oh, psychodynamic is better than Freudian analysis is better than Jungian analysis is better than cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive processing therapy or EMDR or whatever. It's the therapeutic alliance. It's the relationship between the patient and the therapist. It's the sense of safety it's the sense of support, the lack of judgment. That is the most important factor in terms of therapeutic outcomes. So how do you train that? How do you train people to be empathic and compassionate in that way? Well, you know, fortunately, you know, people have a wide variety of things they could do with their lives, with their life work. And so I would say in general, uh, people that want to be therapists are already more empathic and compassionate than on average, but it, it's really difficult to train. And, and that's where I think uh, the self experience. So, um, you know, we, we work with Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. He was principal investigator on the phase three site. Um, he didn't work with us on phase two. So when we we're doing phase three, his advice was um, don't enroll people with complex PTSD, with people that had childhood traumas, that, that never felt safe, terrible attachment, um, very insecure all the time. And so we said, no, it, it seemed that they, they were able to get help, people with complex PTSD in phase two. So Bessel and added a bunch of different measures to phase three in terms of measures of attachment, but also measures of self-compassion and the sense of self-efficacy, um, emotional connections to your emotions, things like that. And so uh, Bessel published this paper about a month ago, um, but what it demonstrated that people with difficult attachments um, didn't seem to get that much better with therapy without MDMA. But when you add therapy with MDMA, now all of a sudden they, they do get better. So I think this idea of this um, sort of self-compassion that we see um, people have more of as part of their therapeutic process, therapists also can experience more of that as part of their training from the MDMA. MDMA does promote the self-acceptance, the self-compassion. Um, and, and so I, I think that there's going to be eventually what we hope is that schools of psychiatry and psychotherapy will adopt trainings about psychedelic psychotherapy as part of the core curriculum. And but that may take a while to get there. So and still then there'll be MAPS uh, or LICO is doing trainings. MAPS is doing international trainings. There's other groups. Um, but eventually it, it, it should go to be part of the core curriculum. And I, I think we'll get there in, in a couple of years. Um, and I think there, there was one Israeli uh, psychiatrist where we got permission to work at the latest uh, or the largest uh, mental hospital in Israel. And that they work with schizophrenics and psychotics and all of that. Um, they don't really do that much therapy. So this one woman psychiatrist in the training said, um, you know, I, I don't think I'd want to take MDMA myself because what might come up? I'm like, oh, my God, if you're worried what might come up, you know, how are you going to be a steady force for somebody dealing with stuff they've suppressed that's super painful? Um, and, and later she said, no, she didn't want to work with us. She realized that it wasn't a good fit. So not to say that all therapists must have their own MDMA experiences, but that this idea of, um, therapists being able to, um, know inside out that when you face 
uh, your fears or, you know, and then accept them and work through them, that that's this way to give quiet confidence to the patients. So of all the things that I've sort of said, you know, the supervision is really important, the initial education, but I do think the therapist self-experience is the most important part. You know, I, I remember this is psychedelic science, uh, 2019 in, in Austin, um, where, uh, you gave a great talk or two. It was a really fun event, smaller than this last one in Denver, of course. Um, but it, I, there was a time when Tim Ferriss was interviewing Marcella up on stage yeah, and, yeah. and she said something really profound that stuck with me and, oh, great, and man. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like it, you can only take people as deep as you've gone yourself. You can only help hold people suffering if you're not afraid of your own, that kind of idea. Yeah. Exactly. Because you will be, um, if you get triggered yourself, you know, then that fear is communicated to the patient because they're fearful also. Um, yeah. And then also when you get triggered yourself, you're no longer really there for the patient. Now you're wrapped up with your own internal struggle. Um, but but we do never want to require it. I mean, again, that that I think is the key thing to emphasize too, that, that it should always be um, optional. And also that therapists who've never done MDMA can actually still get good results. They might have confronted their own inner demons in all these different ways. So I, I don't mean to leave the impression that um, therapists who've done MDMA are somehow or other better than therapists who've not done MDMA or psilocybin or Ibogaine or whatever it happens to be. It's just that I think each person will be more effective if they've done it themselves. So their own comparison is their own control in a sense is what's, and, and I think this um, other part, this Jungian ar archetype that really relates back to Marcella directly is this idea of the wounded healer. You know, the, this person who has had wounds, but was able through whatever different mechanisms found the capacity to heal themselves and then they know it can be done. And there's this quiet kind of confidence that they can um, communicate with the patient that, that, so when you just urge somebody to let go, you know, Bill Richards at Hopkins, you know, his thing was trust, let go, be open. You know, when you, you could encourage somebody to trust, let go, be open. If you can do that, where you're not also telegraphing your terror at what happens, what comes up, then it, it gives a lot more support for people. And so Marcella herself was, you know, I talked about in my TED talk, she was the one I worked with in 1984, the first PTSD patient. So she emerged from being um, suicidal from PTSD to becoming a therapist herself, and then to becoming one of our main trainers of therapists all over the world. And so I think this wounded healer also speaks to self-experience in a way. Yeah. It makes me think of that, you know, that high bar maybe isn't like you're saying that a therapist absolutely has to have psychedelic experience, but they, they need to have done their own work such that they can be attuned, right? That they're not pulled off track when they're triggered themselves or by their own terror, or by their own resistance. They're not, you know, their counter transference isn't getting in the way. Um, so perhaps if the bar is high, uh, it's, it's high because of the degree of self-knowledge and self-work that might be required for somebody who's going to guide somebody else in this work. Yeah, I think that's right. The, the other thing is that there are 13 million PTSD patients in America, you know, so there, there's going to be, so there's enormous suffering, baseline suffering so that, you know, talk about depression, substance uh, dependence, you know, we can go on and on with the other illnesses. So there's, on the one hand, this really urgent need to help people as quickly as we can. But on the other hand, this high bar, I think when we are bringing something that has been so stigmatized, the, the, the other thing why the high bar is so important and just for helping people understand what we're trying to do, um, uh, I think a lot of people have this idea that, um, you know, psychedelics emerged in the 60s and then there was a backlash and now, you know, 60 years, half a century later, we're getting back to it. Um, and that that is true, but that's just too narrow of a slice. What, what the story really is, as I understand it, 
is that it's been around 1500 years plus in Western culture that psychedelics have been suppressed. So it's a monumental thing in human history and human consciousness that we're trying to do. So the Eleusinian mysteries, the foundation of Western thought, the foundations of philosophy and democracy and Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras and all these people, the Greeks had the longest running mystery ceremony in the world, Eleusis from 1600 BC to around 396, wiped out by the Catholic church, which wanted to be the intermediary between people and their spirituality that um, that was the last time that psychedelics were really core in a Western context, in a Western culture. And then after the Catholic Church wiped out these, quote, pagan ceremonies of the Eleusinian mysteries, um, along comes the Middle Ages. And what are they doing? They're burning witches. They're burning people that know about plant medicines. Um, what happens when the conquistadors start coming from uh, Europe to America, the first people they look to kill are the shamans because they're the core of their community. Um, and so there has been the suppression of psychedelics um, for more than a millennium and a half. So when I think about what we're really trying to accomplish, also, Steve, you really said about this mass consciousness change that humanity needs to go through. Um, it's so delicate and so important that we need a high bar on the therapist. We don't want a backlash to set us back at such a critical time of um, potential destructiveness, but potential, you know, healing as well. So I, I'm, I'm sobered by that a lot. And when I, when I see people take this narrow time frame, like, oh, you know, it's just 60 years ago in the 60s, this is when uh, this came out and you know, we've, we've solved everything since then. It, it's, it's really this um, enormous shift in human psyche. If we can successfully transmit, you know, where we're at now to uh, more global spirituality. And, and I guess I'll just um, refer to Robert Mueller, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, who's wrote a book, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality that I read in 1983. That, that's his thesis from the perch of the UN, that there needs to be this shared spirituality, that, that we can't say my religion is the only religion and the only right religion. Uh, I mean, of course we can say that, but, but the thought is that what we need is um, an understanding of the shared spirituality, and then we can then appreciate the different cultural manifestations and the you know, each language is somewhat different and has different flavors than other languages. And so I think if we can see religion as languages, different kind of things, basically to go back to the Good Friday experiment or this idea of a, a unit of mystical experience measured by the mystical experience questionnaire, that that, that was intentionally designed um, by Timothy Leary and Walter Pankey, who did this experiment in 1962, with Christian divinity students from Andover Newton Theological Seminary in church, um, the Boston University Chapel on Good Friday. So religiously inclined people in a religious setting were able to have these, um, you know, spiritual experiences. Um, and from that, there were in my, you know, 25 year follow-up, kind of political implications. They, they did talk about being more ecumenical and, and all of that. So Robert Mueller, you know, from the um, Assistant Secretary General of the UN, um, this new genesis shaping of global spirituality is also about that. That is the theory of change, how consciousness needs to shift in that direction for all of us to stop killing each other and start cooperating. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and that, that view of uh, the broader perspective of religion and a, a semi-related question, because Steve and I are sitting in Utah where, <laughs> among, uh, where Mormonism is a, is a hot topic and a big part of the culture. And i um, wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the fallen Mormon study from back in the day. <laughs> Thank you, Reed. Yeah. I'm glad we, we got to that. So, um, I think what I described how is from uh, 1985, when the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA, they used 
the justification of uh, MDMA neurotoxicity. It was going to be brain damage. And at the time that the DEA did that in 1985, um, there was no studies on MDMA neurotoxicity. There was George Riccardi at the University of Chicago who had done some work with MDA, which is a stronger version of MDMA in um, uh, rodents, and had discovered some, at certain doses, some reduction in serotonin uh, nerve terminals. And, and this was um, used to justify uh, the criminalization. And that was used um, basically to wipe out psychedelic research till 1992. And that was a big part of what was going on um, through the 90s. Um, and so around 2005, um, what I was wanting to do is really um, look at the neurocognitive consequences. So when people talk about MDMA neurotoxicity, um, what, it, you know, the, We've actually replaced the term neurotoxicity more or less with neuroplasticity. It could be even referring to the same thing, but it's like neurotoxicity is negative, neuroplasticity is positive, that you can rewire your brain. Um, so, you know, and then I described how after the, the criticisms of, uh, you know, the serotonin neurotoxicity hypothesis started weakening, that's where uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse got kind of... Um, Desperate, and that's where they came out with this claim about MDMA hurting dopamine. All right, but the the only consequence of sort of heavy ecstasy use from all these studies that people have been able to identify was neurocognitive processing, certain memory things, certain kind of um, not even depression, but but just sort of memory executive function, things like that. And so they had all these studies that ecstasy users were deficient in one way or another. Uh, but the, the thing that made it difficult from a scientific point of view is ecstasy users were doing all sorts of other drugs as well. So how, how do you separate out what's due to MDMA, what's due to alcohol, what's due to marijuana, what's due to this, what's due to that? It's, it's really difficult. So around 2005, I, I get a call from a fella who is a MAPS member, and he says, you know, I, I know you've got this methodological challenge of how to really look at MDMA neurotoxicity. Um, but he said, I've solved it. I, I know how you can solve it. There's a group of people that have only done ecstasy and not any other drug. And I'm like, how, how can that possibly be? He said, well, I'm calling you from Salt Lake City. <laughs> and I'm, I know that these people exist. So um, MAPS gave, uh, this is one of our best uh, business uh, thing for a nonprofit. We, we gave $15,000 to Skip Pope and others at McLean Hospital at Harvard Medical School. They had done neurocognitive consequences of cannabis. They'd also done a study neuroconsequences, uh, uh, neuro, uh, yeah, the neuropsychological consequences of um, peyote with John Helprin. Um, and so I went to them and I said, here's $15,000, uh, do a little pilot study. They went out to Salt Lake City and lo and behold, it turns out, there were a bunch of people. This was, I think, before the Mormon church had declared MDMA to be on the bad list. And there's a bunch of people that had never done alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, anything, but only ecstasy. And so they came back, they, they meaning um, John Harris, John Halpern and uh, Skip Pope. And they said, hey, this population really exists. And then they submitted their pilot data and they got $1.8 million to do the definitive study about MDMA neurocognitive consequences. And so they ended up working on it for quite a bit. And it was very reassuring once they got the data. So, um, you know, heavy, heavy, heavy ecstasy use seems to have minimal to no effect, really, uh, in terms of long-term neurocognitive consequences. We, we've done a neurocognitive tests on two of the different cohorts in our phase two studies before and after and showed no difference. Uh, in fact, people did slightly better. Um, so, you know, it, we, we called it the fallen Mormon study because these were people that grew up Mormon, but that did make an exception for ecstasy. Um, but it proved to be basically the end of the scare stories about MDMA neurotoxicity. This was the best controlled study. And so I guess I just want to say thank you to all the people that grew up Mormon that uh, listened about not doing drugs 
but uh, made an exception for ecstasy. Well, that's, that's amazing. Utah is a great place to do research. I've been doing research since the beginning of my career here and whether it's uh, pedigrees and genetics where a lot of the like the breast cancer genes were discovered or human abuse liabilities studies were kind of pioneered here I've been involved in many where we'd get like like that study you mentioned recreational drug users to come in and and we'd figure out the likability but I love this uh this uh you know, pocket of MDMA only users that you found along the along the kind of crusade. But that's that's pretty neat. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. Well, Rick, we want to be respectful of your time. I think we're just about at, at the end of the time we have allotted. Um, I'm curious in parting, is there you've got a captive audience here of ah. mostly people who are fairly interested in psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy. Is there anything you'd like these folks to hear? Yeah, well, thank you, Steve, for that. There's two things. Um, um, when are you going to air this? Is this? It should be next week, actually. Ah, good. Okay. So um, I'll just remind people that April 8th, uh, 2024, is the 38th anniversary of MAPS. And um, as I like to say, the universe has decided to celebrate MAPS' anniversary with a full solar eclipse that's passing through America. There won't be another one. Uh, till 2044. So we're gathering outside of Austin with uh, in a, about 30 or 40,000 other people at an event that's put on by this group, ctexaseclipse.com. And we've got a psychedelic lecture series for several days. We're camping maps. People are camping together. And so we will be celebrating. So I'm, first off, we'd like to invite people to um, participate in that if, if they'd be interested, ctexaseclipse.com and come celebrate our 38th anniversary and the um, uh, total solar eclipse. Um, the, the other thing is for people to plan ahead, um, we just had um, in um, June of uh, 2023, um, Psychedelic Science 2023, the world's largest conference on psychedelics ever with 12,400 people, totally shocked us. Um, but we're going to do another one around the 16th to the 21st of June, 2025 in Denver, also at the same place. And I would uh, really like to encourage people to, to consider coming to that. Um, I think it'll be the new world. It'll be the, po hopefully it will be the post approval of prescription use of MDMA. Um, and, and I guess the last thing um, I'll just add is that, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about drugs and psychedelics, but this consciousness that we're talking about um, is part of our human nature. It's not in the drug and you can get it through meditation. You can get there through hyperventilation. You can get there through extreme exercise, all, all sorts of different ways. And so I think that to, to emphasize that, it, it really um, makes the point clear that the experiences are not in the pill or in the mushroom or in the peyote or in the ayahuasca. It's, these are tools that open us up to ourselves. And so I, I would just like to um, really encourage people to, to think about um, so many other different ways to access through dreams. Dreams are uh, the, you know, Freud, the royal road to the unconscious. So that I, I just don't want people to, to get the impression that it's all about psychedelics. It's really about the consciousness and the consciousness shift that we need to make. Um, and, and, I don't think that psychedelics are necessarily for everybody either. So it's not that, you know, people will miss out on some critical thing if they find some other path to some of these experiences. Um, but I, but I would encourage people to really, um, maybe this is a good place to end, which is that what I'm really trying to do and what we are, I think most of the uh, researchers are trying to do is bring forward psychedelic medicine. So MDMA, I think, is great for PTSD. And there are other things, you know, um, Ibogaine is really, really good for helping people go through um, sort of the detox from opiates. You know, so, so there are certain things that are better for certain other things, but really it's about bringing forth psychedelic medicine and the psychedelic therapists of the future will be cross-trained with MDMA, with ketamine, with psilocybin, with LSD, with 5-MeO-DMT, with you know, Ibogaine, Ayahuasca, all this, and that the psychedelic clinics of the future will be places where people will go 
to receive sort of customized bespoke treatments just for them by their therapists who have a range of tools. And at the same time, um, I think that, um, you know, they, they should be available, you know, without these highly controlled contexts. So, you know, I think people, if they can balance on the one hand, this captive audience that you say that's listening, you know, this, Mm -hmm. the dire state straits that humanity is in with the challenges of bringing forth psychedelics and think about, um, the different ways that we can all try to bring this forward without a backlash. And I think that means honestly speaking about the risks, not minimizing the risks and not um, overestimating the benefits and being clear it doesn't work for everybody. And, um, but hopefully many of the people, since it's the psychotherapy, psychedelic therapy frontiers, many of the people listening are, are therapists. I would just say that they are the critical therapists are the critical, um, ingredient in, in how we move forward and whether society really does, um, embrace these tools or whether, we have yet another backlash. And so thank you for having me here and for trying to educate therapists in the many ways that you do. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Sobering and and lots of really, I think, good reasons to be hopeful too. So I really appreciate you being the intrepid torchbearer that you are and uh, for carving out time in your schedule to talk to us and our audience. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. That's been a gift. We appreciate it. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous, a mental wellness company committed to tackling the global mental health crisis by delivering best-in-class psychedelic-assisted therapies, contributing to the body of primary and clinical psychedelic research, and fostering healing through community connection and social responsibility. You can learn more about Numinous at Numinous.com. That's N-U-M-I-N-U-S.com. If you enjoyed the show today and you want to support us, here's how you do it. Rate and review the show on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe to the Numinous YouTube channel, like the videos, and share it. Share the show or clips of the show with someone that you think will enjoy it. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Consult with a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.